12 million men, women, and children passed through corridor after corridor, chasing their freedom as it slowly appeared in front of them. Families anxiously awaited their turn in the register room as they would be able to live in a new country with a new life and a new opportunity. In this unknown place, immigrants sat restlessly with no knowledge of what was to come, encountering families similar to their own. The exchange of cultures would quickly diversify America, creating a modern atmosphere that allowed people to act freely and practice their own beliefs. By giving foreigners a gateway to a new country, Ellis Island enabled our nation to explore different ways of life that had never been seen before. Ellis Island was established for the purpose of processing newly arrived immigrants looking to explore a new country with fortuity. This island was a safe haven for people that originated from almost every continent all around the globe. America was an ideal country to many foreigners, and Ellis Island was a way to regulate and monitor the vast number of new arrivals. The draw was not Ellis Island itself, it was America. Immigrants came to America in search of a better life while they still incorporated their foreign backgrounds. To achieve this, they had to go through a tedious process. The majority of people arrived on steamships by the thousands. The journeys on the ships included overcrowded spaces, hazardous weather, and sometimes days and months aboard. Substandard food and sanitation conditions would steer away a wide amount of foreigners, but the majority of people would endure these conditions for the opportunity at an American life. Upon arrival, immigrants were greeted with the patriotic symbol, the Statue of Liberty. The poor lower class passengers would have to begin the registration process in order to finally become citizens of the U.S. For most immigrants, the registry room characterized Ellis Island. This is where they encountered the intricate immigration laws and the American government that could either grant or withhold the right to land in the United States. The medical inspections began as soon as the immigrants went up the stairs into the Great Hall. U.S. Public Health Service doctors quickly scanned each person for any sign of a disease. Uh, questioning, interrogation, of, of medical examination of long lines and being ordered about and told to do this and that. And, and of course, people were tagged. They had tags. They had, um, you know, their clothes. If they found something, they marked the immigrants' clothing with chalk. For example, E for eyes if symptoms of trachoma or other eye conditions were detected. An X marked if mental disease was suspected. According to a 1917 U.S. Public Health Service manual, 9 out of 100 immigrants were marked with an X and sent to mental examination rooms. All marked immigrants were separated from the rest for further inspection. Patients who recovered were usually allowed to land, but others whose ailments were incurable were sometimes sent back to their original countries. After the medical inspection, the immigrants were faced with a barrage of background questions. The Immigration Service collected a significant amount of information about the passengers' plans in the country. They were asked about their financial status and if they had relatives or a place to live. This part was confusing for the immigrants whose English was not perfect. There was a schoolroom for detainees on the island where the kids were taught American songs and games and where some adults learned their first words of English. Here they became accustomed to the traditions of Americans, learned about the history of the country, and were introduced to holidays such as Thanksgiving for the first time. This was the first real exchange between newcomers and American citizens. Once a detainee was released and families passed all of the screenings, they were issued landing cards to permit them to stay in the United States. Once all examinations were complete, all immigrants would proceed to the stairs of separation. The stairway was divided into three paths, which determined the next step in their journey. The right side to the railroad ticket office, the central stairs to the detention rooms, and the left side to the New York ferry. These stairs marked the parting of ways for a multitude of families and friends with different destinations. Immigrants could now reclaim their bags, exchange for U.S. money, and finally take the ferry to their desired landing place. Many cheerful reunions occurred between relatives and newly arriving people. When New York City introduced Ellis Island to the world in 1892, millions of people's lives changed. The island allowed desperate immigrants into America. Therefore, our country became highly diverse. Each U.S. citizen had a different background. In almost every city, you could find variations of migrants from German, Scandinavian, or Italian descent. America came to be known as the land of new opportunities to nations across the ocean. People could escape their problems back home, such as poverty and oppression, and start over by coming through places like Ellis Island. Many immigrants fled their homelands to avoid political persecution or the violence of religious groups different from their own. By 1910, 75% of New York, Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, and Boston's inhabitants were immigrants or the children of immigrants. 
there were a great number of reasons for immigrants to come to the United States. Well, the main pull was, for, you know, it's true, the potato famine was one of the major waves, but, but the, generally the pull was, was, were twofold. One was the great poverty of Ireland. Ireland is a very, very beautiful country, one of the most beautiful countries in Europe, but, it's all, but it was also one of the poorest countries. Through Ellis Island, many new ideas, cultures, and civilizations came to America. As immigrants left their homes for various reasons, they brought with them numerous aspects of their heritage. Immigrant neighborhoods, despite dealing with severe poverty, were able to build churches and synagogues preserving their religious traditions. In addition, ethnic organizations began to create neighborhood clubs, funds for social programs, and started lobbying for Congress to pass beneficial legislation for immigrants. As more ethnicities and cultures continued to merge and encounter each other, the melting pot of nationalities and customs was slowly created. After passing inspections, immigrants were immediately thrust into their new lives. Most went to the houses of relatives and friends. Since all of these immigrants spoke the language of their home country, they had to learn the English dialect and accustom themselves to a very different American lifestyle. This was just the beginning for their life here in America. Almost every single person that came through the immigration station had no money, nothing to start a life. What they needed was a job and to have stable income to keep them on their feet. Not only were immigrants able to encounter the several different ethnic and religious cultures coming from every single foreigner, but they were able to exchange their beliefs, customs, and traditions with everyone. New York soon became a funnel for all new cultures to pour into and converge with each other. Many cultures' traditions were absorbed into others, and soon the many different backgrounds merged. As thousands upon thousands of people moved through the now engrossed hallways of the main Ellis Island buildings, they anxiously awaited their acceptance into the country. Although the island was a great way to distribute new cultures and people around the U.S., it also created a few problems. As more and more immigrants lined up for the chance at the American dream, more and more competition in the workforce arose. Immigrants were desperate for any job they could find, and they would take any wage that was available. Many native-born Americans were now losing their jobs to the migrants who would work longer hours for cheaper wages. Illegal immigration was also a problem. The new arrivals were required to prove identities and pass inspections, but that didn't prevent some illegal immigrants from slipping through. During the Great Depression, very few people had the means or incentive to come to the U.S. The recession left numerous people without jobs or homes. When Franklin D. Roosevelt became president in 1933, Americans were struggling to survive the greatest economic depression the country had ever seen. Many Americans feared that needy immigrants would take precious jobs or place an added strain on an already burdened economy. Throughout World War II, refugees fleeing Nazi persecution arrived, but were turned away due to the harsher laws and regulations. The new quota system of the 1924 U.S. Immigration and Nationality Act imposed severe restrictions on immigration based on nationality. A particular country that the quota system applied to was Germany. The quota would take only 27,370 Germans in 1939. Over 300,000 German Jewish refugees fleeing from the Holocaust had applied for entry permits the previous year. Only 20,000 of those were approved. The American government did not hesitate to reject any applicant who they thought could cause problems in the future. This negatively affected many Jewish refugees because their homeland was greatly suffering due to the Holocaust. When the Nazis gained control, they lost everything and looked to the United States for help. Although this was a low point in American emigrational history, Ellis Island was able to give over 12 million other people a chance at a new life. Places like Little Italy and Chinatowns could be found in almost every major city, giving American citizens the chance to explore and learn about a diverse set of traditions. The impact this small island would have on society was astronomical. The encounters of new cultures made our country a melting pot of different backgrounds and people. The exchanges between immigrants and natural-born citizens would mix and slowly begin to create a new culture altogether, a culture of people descended from hundreds of different nationalities. Close to 40% of U.S. citizens can trace their lineage back to Ellis Island, and true to its nickname, the Gateway to Freedom offered immigrants a glimmer of hope and a chance at a new beginning.
the clock towers over the Hudson River. A hundred years ago, passengers might have glanced at it as they walked to their train or ferry at the Central Railroad of New Jersey Terminal at Liberty State Park. There's a real nostalgia here. I mean, not only with the train shed, but also with the interior. Um, it's quite beautiful, and it is of an era that's gone by. So there's a past that we have to appreciate and respect. This building was constructed in 1889. The terminal was expanded over the years to keep up with the growing demand. By the turn of the century, 30 to 50,000 people pass through the doors daily on 300 trains and about 130 ferry runs. So the area that the trains came into is called the train shed. And the ones that we have today are very historic. It's called the Bush style train shed, named after the engineer who designed them, Abraham Lincoln Bush. And the ones that are here are the largest train shed of its type ever built. It's a 20 track train shed. The train shed was built to protect passengers from bad weather, says historic interpreter Janet Oktarshanas. Not everyone boarded a train at the terminal. There was once a ferry house attached to the building. The stairs, now called the stairs to nowhere, once led to the second floor of that building. The ticket windows and luggage racks date back to the early 1900s. Today, passengers can still purchase tickets to Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty inside the majestic waiting room. The wood ceiling and all of those iron trusses are original to the 1889 building. And it's really fantastic. Um, the design, so at the time they were using material in a new way. So you could see using metal there. So it was for support, but again, they used it for decoration. The trains often took people to work or vacation. And the most famous is the Blue Comet. So the Blue Comet had a very short run. It just ran from 1929 to 1941 to Atlantic City. And it was the brainchild of the president of the Central Railroad of New Jersey of the time. His name was Roy White. He wanted to get some of that Atlantic City market. It was considered a deluxe train for standard fare and had a dining car. Which for a three hour trip today for a plane ride, you're lucky if you get a bag of peanuts, right? This is one of the original tablecloths. The historic terminal now has artifacts on display like these trunks. There are religious illustrations inside this one. You have to understand that a person who maybe grew up on a farm, getting on a ship for the first time and going halfway around the world would really want to do a lot of prayer, uh, praying and have a lot of help. Two thirds of the immigrants who were processed at Ellis Island went through this terminal. In the ferry house, there was an area called the immigrant waiting room. Their railroad officials would escort the immigrants to their trains, and those trains took them to their new homes. Future generations need to be able to see firsthand how their ancestors came here in the first place. There are no tracks left at the terminal. Janet says the Central Railroad of New Jersey sold them when the business went bankrupt in 1967. Although the trains left the station, staffers here are determined to preserve its history. In Jersey City, I'm Lauren Wonko and JTV News.